Hi everyone, um, thanks again for joining. Um, I can see a lot of you um, were in our previous sessions, so welcome back. Um, hope you had a chance to grab a cup of tea. Um, for those of you that have just joined, um, just to give you a bit of background, um, as most of you know, we were due to host our customer day today at the Science Museum in London. However, of course, due to current circumstances, um, we've had to postpone that. Um, but we didn't want you to miss out on anything um, and we still wanted to share some really great content, which is why we've hosted the webinars today. Um, so this is our final session, Content Managing a Progressive Web App um, with Darren Lee, um, our VP of Engineering. Darren will be running a live coding session, um, adding content management to React components. And he'll also be highlighting the concepts and considerations when it comes to progressive web apps. Um, again, before we start, um, just want to draw your attention to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions at all, um, please pop them in the box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so with that said, Darren, I'll pass over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Maddie. Um, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in for this. Uh, so as Maddie said, uh, I'm Darren Lee, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction today on adding content management to a progressive web app. So just a quick agenda, just to get us started. So to begin with, uh, I thought I would just cover a couple of concepts. I appreciate that some of you might be well along the path to building a progressive web app, whereas others might just be starting to try and figure out if that's the right decision for their business. So I thought I'd just lay the foundation a little bit. What is a progressive web app? I'll look at a couple of different architectures. And then from there, we'll get into some live coding. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have an in-person audience to tell me when I'm missing a semicolon, but I think it will be okay. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to take an existing progressive web app that has no content management, and we're going to add content management into a few key places inside that application. So we'll start out with a really simple navigation menu, something that's relatively simple data-wise, but super important to be able to be content managed. Um, and then we'll go to something a little bit more advanced. So we'll let business users take over and control a larger area on a page within our progressive web app. And then finally, we'll bring all that back together again and actually take the components that we built and put them back into the CMS so that we can start to think a little bit about how those business users will interact with the CMS day in, day out when they're making content changes. And then at the end, uh, time for Q&A, and I'll share some resources as well, some further reading, um, including the code from today. So you'll be able to grab that and follow along if, that's, uh, if that interests you. So what is a progressive web app? What do we mean when we say progressive web app? Well, the term was coined in 2015 uh, by a chap called Alex Russell at Google. And he has an interesting way of describing it. It's not the most clearest way of describing it, it but um, he basically describes it as progressive web apps are just websites that took all the right vitamins. And what he was trying to describe was websites that have a much more app-like experience. So over the past 10 years or so, browsers have been getting lots and lots and lots of new features that let you build a much better, much higher performance experience. And Together, if you implement a handful of those things, then you have built a progressive web app, essentially. But fundamentally, it's about making websites behave like applications, like a native application, and delivering a really good user experience. So there are a number of characteristics that progressive web apps have. I won't go through all of them. This list isn't even the entire list. If you go do a lighthouse audit, you'll, you'll see like a much larger list. Um, but I do want to draw attention to a couple that are really important to get right. Uh, so right at the top there, uh, lightning fast. Uh, so progressive web apps have a lot of tricks in their toolkit to make them really fast. Uh, one of the main ones is actually in the name, progressive. Uh, so they use this thing called progressive enhancement. And the idea is that you want to present content. You want to paint pixels onto the user's screen as quickly as possible. And you can progressively enhance everything else functionality, interactivity, some data fetching, you can do those things after the first second. The most important thing is to get that content onto the screen as quickly as possible. Because uh, if, you, you know, if you were interacting with a native app and you click on that icon on your home screen, it's up and running pretty quickly, right? And that's the type of experience that websites should be having. The, the second point there, connectivity independent. 
Uh, we've all been on the tube or the subway and had the T-Rex in the corner there, the Chrome T-Rex uh, pop up because we're not on the internet. That's just a really frustrating experience, right? It's, it's not something that you tend to get with a native app, right? I can open up a native app and keep shopping, keep adding things to basket, browse the catalog, because in the background, it's synchronized lots of data to my phone. And that just makes it a much more enjoyable experience. And then finally, just generally more app-like experiences. So having interaction patterns that resemble native apps, using features like notifications so that you can re-engage with users and get them coming back into the application. Even simple things like a home screen icon, right? So I can just go straight to the website. I don't have to type in a URL, remember where it is that I'm going. Um, but there's a, there's a long list of things that you can do to make a really good progressive web app. But fundamentally, users just like apps that work. And native apps are particularly good at working, right? If you're on the subway, if you, if you have a bad connection, native apps work really well. But there's no reason websites can't work equally as well. All the tools are there now. All the open standards exist in the browser to make much better websites that act like native apps without any of that proprietary native app code or having to build multiple versions of the application. So how do you actually go about building a progressive web app? So I, I did say earlier that any website can technically be a progressive website, and that is technically true. But the reality is that it's, just, it's very difficult to make a traditional website perform and interact more like an application. Uh, you typically end up having to build multiple versions of the application. You need a lot of specialist skills. It just it gets very complicated. But the good news is the industry has responded, and there are tons of tools and frameworks that make it really easy to build this type of application. And these tools are not new, right? These tools have been around for a long time. So, you know, if you look at React, React is coming up on seven years old. Angular is even older than that. These are skills that are easy to hire, they're easy to find, and they're skills that developers want to be working with. So definitely don't consider any of these edge case technologies. You know, these are proven technologies, they're highly productive, and just a great way to build this type of application. But something that's incredibly important is don't forget content management. You know, a lot of people are building progressive web apps now, and that requires you to take over that application and build that front end. But there are people out there that are forgetting to build into that content management. And so what they're left with is an experience where developers are involved in making every possible change to that application. You know, if you want to change some content on the home page or change some links in the footer component, something like that, you have to get developers involved. And business users don't want that. They can't make the changes they want to make. And equally, developers don't want that. You know, they would much rather be adding features to the PWA than having to make content changes every day. Uh, so it's really important to get this right. So with that in mind, uh, I thought we'd have a quick look at some architectures for building a progressive web app. So the one we're going to look at today is a pattern called server-side rendering. And it's a very familiar pattern. Um, and I chose this because it's the pattern that I see most retailers implementing. It's also a relatively simple pattern to implement. So it's, it's easier to work with. Um, now, the idea is that when you build your, your application, your PWA, you will build it in such a way whereby it can be rendered on the server and it can be rendered client side. So tools like React and Vue and Angular are really good at building what are called universal apps or isomorphic apps. And what that means is it means that we can pre-render all of the pages, all of the content, or sorry, we can render the pages when a user makes a request and we can serve them HTML really quickly. So that's very similar to a traditional model, right? I get a set of HTML to a browser really quickly and I can see content straight away. Then in the background, the React application will hydrate and it will attach onto all of that HTML that was rendered on the server and was probably cached in a CDN and add all the interactivity. And at this stage, we can go and do any supplementary data fetching. So any non-essential data can also be fetched at that point in time. And so again, it's following that pattern of get pixels on the screen as soon as you possibly can but, but then add the interactivity. Don't forget about that app-like experience. That still needs to happen. And so the application we'll be looking at today roughly looks like this. We have a React application. It has in it some routing, some pages. 
so it has a home page in today's example. And that home page is made up of several components. So we have lots of small components and a few big components uh, that come together to make that home page. And the application itself has access to our API layer. So typically when you're rendering this page, this home page, we're going to need to fetch some data from some APIs. So one of those APIs is a CMS. You know, we want to be able to go to dynamic content and say, what content should I be displaying for this particular page? But equally, you would be calling lots of other APIs, e-commerce APIs like catalog cart, some CRM, whole range of APIs that you would typically call when rendering a page. So that's the architecture we're going to go with today. I do just want to point out two other architectures because they are worth knowing about, uh, but we won't zoom in too much on them today. Uh, so the first one is to add an aggregation layer into the mix. So something that happens in the previous diagram that I showed you is if you have a lot of APIs to call, your application is going to be quite chatty, right? So when I load that page, it might have to make 20 different API calls to get all the data that we need for this page. Um, in this version, what you would do is you would add an aggregation layer between your APIs and your application just to make it a little bit less chatty. And there's two really good ways of doing that. The first one is GraphQL, really good standard technology uh, for aggregating up APIs and letting you traverse, uh, uh, project them slightly differently. Um, another pattern is uh, BFFs or backends for the front end. And this is where you sort of create an API that's tailored more to your particular application. So it's going to wrap up your APIs and return something a bit more specific to your web app or your native app or so on. Um, another pattern that's just worth knowing about is a statically generated site. And the tools that I mentioned earlier, like React and Next and things like this, um, they're typically pretty flexible. They can do all of these different architectures. Um, with a statically generated site, you basically flip, flip the architecture on its head. So rather than rendering a page when a user makes a request to your web server, you actually render the pages offline. So whenever anything changes, whenever the content changes, whenever data that is needed in the page changes, like uh, maybe you have pricing or some product data in there, whenever that changes, you recompile all the pages and you ship them off to a CDN. So that, that has a great advantage in terms of performance. It means that when somebody requests one of these pages, there is basically no work to do. The page is already pre-computed, but it's very difficult to do this if you have a very heavily data-driven website. And e-commerce websites tend to be very heavily data-driven. Um, so it's not impossible, but it isn't as trivial as going for a statically uh, server-side rendered application. Um, I'll just point out that this is how our website is built. So amplians.com uh, is using a statically generated uh, architecture. Um, also, our product blog is doing that as well. And there are blog posts and code samples about that on our GitHub. So if you are interested in that architecture, there's plenty to go and read on our product blog for that. Great. And then uh, finally, from an architecture point of view, I just wanted to sort of point out what steps we're going to go through today to add content management to the architecture. And it should be a pretty familiar set of steps uh, if you've already implemented dynamic content. So we're going to start out by looking at our application and identifying the components in this application that we would like to content manage. Here, I'm identifying two components. When we get to the uh, live coding, we'll probably do a couple more. Uh, but for here, I've identified a menu, a navigation menu at the top, and an editorial block in the middle of the page. So once you've identified the things that business users need to be able to change on a regular basis, you then need to create a representation of those in the CMS. So we're going to go into the CMS and we're going to make objects that represent these constructs that business users can open up and make changes to. And then finally, it's just some simple plumbing. So we would want our application to fetch the content from the CMS. And equally, we need to then render that content into the UI once that comes back in. So I think that's enough slides and we can get into some live coding. So let me switch over to Visual Studio Code. And I might start in the browser, actually. And I'll show you the application uh, that we're going to be modifying. So uh, the application we're going to be working on today is built using Next.js. Next.js is a framework for building progressive web apps. Uh, it is a very flexible, very easy to use framework. So I recommend it. Um, one of the great things about Next.js is that it can 
be used for server-side rendered applications. It can be used for statically generated applications. And it's got a whole host of other features in there, like GraphQL. And you can really go nuts with it. Um, so it's a good starting point for this, I think. And if we have a quick look at the application itself, so what we have here is a, a progressive web app um, for our pretend uh, brand, Anya Finn. And if we have a little look around, so we have our navigation component at the top here. We also have a, a sidebar version of that for smaller resolutions. And then on the page itself, we've got a header, pretty standard. We have some content blocks. So we have this uh, hero banner, we have an editorial widget, and we have this gallery component at the bottom. And then we just have a sort of standard footer at the bottom of the page. And normally when you're looking at an application, you'd normally just be able to see the whole application. Um, but we're using a technology called Storybook in this project that lets you see the components. So if you're not familiar with it, Storybook is a documentation slash testing tool, and it lets you make each of the individual components in your project visible. And that's really good if you're collaborating with designers or business users, they can actually go in and see all of the widgets that your application has. So you don't need to reinvent things, right? It's, it's quite typical that somebody will, want, will create a design that actually already matches a component. They just didn't know that that component existed in the code. So um, I really like Storybook. Um, but if we show you a couple of the components that make up this application, so here, we're, here we are on the header component. But if we look at some of the components that we want to content manage, so here is the navigation component. Again, pretty similar to what we saw earlier. Um, and then we have those content widgets. So we had the hero banner block. So there's a place for a title, some splash text, call to action, image, typical uh, sort of banner block. Uh, we also have an editorial block. So again, a title, some text. In this case, it supports rich text, so some markdown. So you can put links and uh, bolding and different styles in there. Um, and then we also have our gallery component here. So this is where we have the set of cards that we would display next to each other to promote a few different things. So all of these components come together to create the home page for this application. And if I open up the code for the home page, so here under pages, I have an index component. So this component is our home page. Now the thing you'll notice though is that it is full of hard coded data. So here I have my navigation structure all hard coded. Um, and then we also have the different components that we just looked at hard coded. So here I've got that hero banner block and I filled out all of these attributes manually. They're all just in there as hard coded data. And so hero banners here, editorial block and gallery block, they're all just components that I am instantiating in the homepage to make that homepage. Uh, but what I really want to do is I want the business users to have access to make changes to all of these things. So that's what we're going to start with uh, today. So what I'm going to do first is I think to begin with, let's start with the navigation menu. That's a relatively simple example to look at. So we can see here, if I actually open up the navigation component, um, this is a standard React component. So it takes in properties and those properties then get used to render the interface. So here I've got some DOM, which is using those properties. So uh, here, for example, for every link, I'm outputting the title of each link. Um, so that's just basic sort of uh, data binding. Um, but you can see here, if we look at the properties for this component, I am taking in an array of links. And each link is an object which has a title and a hyperlink. And that looks very similar to this object that I was passing into it, right? So that is the set of properties that this component needs in order to be displayed. So with that, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go into the CMS and I'm going to create a representation of that object inside dynamic content. So uh, you should be familiar with this, but if not, uh, this is the development tab. This is where a developer will go into DC and go and set up all the data types. Um, so I'm going to head over to our schemas, to our content types, and I've already set up the boilerplate, but I've left them blank so that we can edit them together. So if I open up this component here called global navigation, so I've created a content type and I've called it global navigation. You could call it anything that you want. And inside here, I'm going to replicate the properties that my navigation component requires. So if you remember, we had an array of links. So this was a type array. And every item in the array was an object. Oops. Object. And every object 
had two properties on it. It had a title, which was a string. And it also had a hyperlink called href, which was also a string. Cool. So you can now see on the uh, right-hand side what the business user interface is going to look like for this. So as a business user, I wouldn't have to enter JSON. I would just have to come in here and say that I want to add some links, fill out the title, fill out the hyperlink for those, uh, and then be able to save that content. Now, on the left-hand side, I very specifically made my fields match my React components, but I could quite easily go in here and start adding different uh, help text in here. So even though I'm matching my React components, I could say to the business user, this is called hyperlink rather than href, just to make that a little bit more user-friendly, for example. And so you can put all the validation rules, all the uh, various metadata that you want in here. So if I save that, and if we just have a quick look at the sample output, so this is a generated example of what the API is going to return. So when our application calls the CMS to get the content, this is roughly the shape of the JSON that will come back. And it's what we expected, right? So it is an array of links with a title and a href, all relatively simple. So now that I've created a representation of that, I'm going to go and create an instance of this object. So I've designed the data model, but I actually need to make an instance of that that a business user can go in and change. So if I head over to content types real quick, I actually to synchronize that so that I can bring in those changes. So sync with schema. And then finally, we can go into the production tab. So this is where all of the content items themselves live. And I'm going to go and create an instance of my navigation component. And I'll just fill out a couple of the links that we already had in there. So we had a home link, we had a men's link, a women category link, and a lookbook. And I think we had a blog as well. So let's go for that. Cool. And so I'll save that. So now anytime a business user wants to make a change to the navigation, they would come in here, they would find this object, the global navigation object, and they would just make their changes inside here. So what I need to do now is I need to connect this up into the application. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a name. First of all, I'm going to use a feature called delivery key. Delivery key is a relatively new feature, which lets you give an object a name, like an ID that you can retrieve it by. And it's really useful for things like routing. If you want to get the content for a particular page URL uh, things like that, I'm just using it because it's easier to work with here. So uh, I'm going to call this global slash navigation. And that's it. I've now set up the CMS to make this content managed. So now we just need to do a little bit of plumbing in the code. So if I go back to my home page, we'll scroll to the bottom here, and you'll see there's a function here called get initial props. Now, this is a feature of Next.js. Other frameworks, they all have an equivalent or similar to this. Um, this function basically will invoke when somebody makes a request to render this page. And this is my opportunity to go and do any data fetching that I might need to render this page. So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to do some data fetching. So I'm going to say my navigation equals fetch content. And then I'm going to put in the delivery key that I want to look up. Now, this fetch content function isn't magic. I've actually included it in the code already. I didn't use our SDK because I wanted to show how simple this actually is. Um, so this function literally just calls a URL, which is our content API slash get me some content by its delivery key. And this is the delivery key. And it will return you the JSON that you wanted, the JSON that we saw earlier. So super easy to get that data back out of the CMS uh, and very performant as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start passing that data forward into my component. And because I'm using TypeScript, so if you're not familiar with it, TypeScript is like a type safe version of JavaScript. I need to go in and actually define the types uh, in my interface here. So, so we had a property called navigation, and it has a property called links which is an array of objects, and each object has a title and a hyperlink. And when I save that, that should all go green. So then down here, I should now be able to extract that property. So this, these props here, 
these are the properties that get passed into my page. And these, these are the properties that I returned from my get initial props function. So if I just put navigation here. So now what I have is I have access to the content from the CMS when I'm rendering my page. So what I will do is where I've got this hard coded set of links, I'm going to delete that. And I'm just going to plumb that directly into this field. And if we now go back to our application, then we should see no change because I didn't change the content. But if I now go into the CMS and make a change, so let's say, I don't know, maybe we want to add a sale uh, menu item. So sale, we'll hit save on that. And we should then get a sale menu item. So just to quickly recap what's happening there. So I'm asking the server for a page. It's calling my code for my page. We're fetching the content from the CMS and we are just plumbing it directly into our navigation component. And we're also plumbing it into our sidebar component too. So we're actually using one set of content to drive two different components here. So if we bring this up, uh, you should see the sale is here as well. Cool. So that is a relatively simple use case. You know, that's great for experience management concepts where you sort of know the area of the application you want to plumb the data into. You can just do a direct mapping. Uh, but what about the rest of this home page? So I've got three content blocks on this page, but I would love it if my business users could add new blocks, remove blocks, um, and basically make design the page essentially, like change the page layout. And so that's what we're going to do next. We're going to add a little bit more flexibility and creativity uh, to the CMS setup. So again, the first thing I would need to do is create a representation of each of these components, these three components inside the CMS. So again, if I just bring up real quick, let's bring up the hero banner component. Again, you'll see here, these are the properties that get passed into that component. It's pretty simple, right? It's an image, it's a title, a description, and some call to action information. And these properties then get rendered into the actual HTML that's gonna be displayed. So title gets output, description, and so on. Um, and it's the same for the other two components. You know, we can have a quick look. The gallery block is slightly more complicated. It has an array of items, and each item, a gallery item, has an image, a title, call to action, and a hyperlink. And then finally, the editorial block, uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, has a title and a description. And like I was saying earlier, that description is actually markdown. Uh, so we're actually rendering that using a markdown component so we can do rich text and more advanced styling. So I just need to recreate all of these props inside the CMS. So I've gone ahead and done that already, and I'll just give you a quick tour of what that looks like. So here you can see that I've created a content type for each component. So I have my component, I've called it component hero banner block component gallery block and component editorial block. Now, if I open up one of these, then you should see all the fields that we just talked about, right? These are all the properties that we just saw. Now, you might notice that I've added an extra property in here called component. So why have I done that? Well, in the first example, we knew that the data we were fetching was a navigation menu. So we could just plumb it directly to the navigation component very simply. Here, we're actually going to let business users choose which components are in what position on the page. So the component at position one might be a hero banner, but it might also be an editorial block or it might be the gallery component. We don't know. The business user is in control of that. We want them to be in control of that. So that means in our code, we need to have some way of knowing which component to use when we display that piece of content. So the way that I'm doing this today, and there are lots of ways of doing it, but the way that I've chosen to do it here is by adding a constant into my content type. So here I have a field called component, and I've hard coded it to be hero banner block. So whenever anybody creates one of these objects, it will be mapped to the hero banner block component. And if you have a look at the JSON output again, so these are all the fields that I've defined, all the sort of props that you would expect. And at the top here is that hard-coded component value. So that's going to come back in the JSON that comes back from the array. And we can then use that as a tell, as a hint, for which component we want to use to display this content. And so if we just have a quick look at some of the other components, we've repeated the exact same thing. So this is the gallery block. 
And this time I have a component field hard coded to gallery block. And again, the output JSON will return the fact that it's a gallery block. And so that gives us our hint uh, to be able to map that. And then the rest of this data is just the fields in my props. So a title field, an array called items where each item has an image, a title, call to actions. These are our gallery items essentially. So, so I've already gone ahead and created these content types, so I won't show that. And um, just a pointer, if you do check out this project, we've included the content types in the project, and we actually have a CLI that's meant that's uh, described in the readme. So you can just run a command and it will sync these content types directly into your account. So if you want to automate the setup, that's already ready to go. Uh, but if we just head back in here real quick, um, the final thing that I'm going to need is now that I've actually created the individual components, so the header, sorry, the, uh, the hero banner, the editorial block, and the gallery, I need something to contain them. I need a container like a slot so that business users have somewhere they can go in the CMS to add and remove items to that collection. So if we go back into the schemas, I've already set it up, but I haven't filled out the fields again. So we have this content type called page slot. I'm gonna open this up and we're gonna fill this out. So I basically want this to be a set of components to display on the page. So it should be an array of components. So I'm gonna add a field, which is a list of content links. If you're not familiar with them, a content link is basically a way to reference another component inside our CMS. So if you're breaking down your content into smaller building blocks, a content link is how you connect them back together again. So I'm going to create a field called components. And uh, so this is an array of, uh, so it's an array of content links. And down here, I can tell the system what objects, what types of content can go inside this array. So I'm only going to add the three components we just created. So I'm going to add the hero banner block. I'm going to add the editorial block and I will add the gallery block and we'll hit save on this. And again, we'll have a look at the sample JSON that would come back from the API. So here, we can see that there is an array of components and every object in that array, although we don't know what type it will be, it will have that component constant so that we know that this is the gallery block or this is a, um, a hero banner and so on and so on. So, same as before, I'm gonna synchronize that content type to get those changes applied. And then we're going to go and actually create that homepage slot, that container for the homepage. So I'll come in here. I will say add new page slot. And I will set it up with the content that's already in the page. So I've gone ahead and created the, comp the content that we already see. So we have this home comforts hero banner. We have some uh, personal shopping editorial text. And we have a gallery block at the bottom of the page. I'm going to save this and we'll call this homepage hero slot maybe. And we'll just hit save on that. So again, this is now the place that a business user would go if they want to change the content that's on the homepage. If they want to rearrange the page layout, add or remove blocks to it. So all we've done is made a representation of that in the CMS. And again, if I go back into the production tab, I can give this a name, a delivery key, so that I can fetch it programmatically. So I'll call this one slots, homepage hero, and we'll hit save. <clears throat> so if we head back into the code, we can do the plumbing that we need to make this work. So again, we're going to need to fetch this data when we render the page. So we'll do something like this, where we say uh, fetch a slot using its name, using its delivery key. And again, we'll pass that forward into our component. So I'm just passing that along. And then up here, we're going to need to define the data model for that again. I'm going to be a little bit lazy and just say it's an array of objects rather than define each one individually. Uh, so a slot has a property called components, and we'll say that's an array of objects just to speed things up a little bit. Um, so again, I now have access to that content when I'm rendering this page, when this component executes. So what I now need to do is replace all of these hard-coded components with whatever the CMS is telling me to display. So let's just comment these out so they're not displaying. And we'll add in a little bit of code here. 
So basically what we want to do is we want to say for every component in that array of components that came back from the CMS, we want to render something, right? So this function is where we're going to choose what to render for each of these components. And I have a little snippet here uh, just to speed things up. So this component property at the top here, that is the fragment of JSON that came back from the CMS for each component. And if you remember, because of the way we set up the data modeling, we can now expect every item in that array to have a field, a constant called component that tells us which component to display it with. So what I've got here is I've got a switch statement where depending on the value of that constant, I'm going to choose which component, which React component to use to display this object. And so finally, at the end here, I can say uh, return component type. So rather than that being a hard coded component name, I'm now using a variable to tell me which component to display. Now, that's good. That's a good start. That will display three empty uh, content blocks. Um, because as well as actually creating the component like this, you also need to set the attributes, right? So the image, the title, the description, all those bits of metadata need assigning as well. And you'll notice that throughout this, I've been carefully making sure that all of my properties in my content types line up with my component properties. So all the props that go into my component types have a one-to-one -one mapping in the CMS, even though I'm maybe calling them something else to the business user, so it's more intuitive. The underlying data model is exactly the same as my React components. And so that means I don't have to do any data mapping or anything complicated. I can just copy all of the attributes that come back from the CMS into the component. And you can do that using the spread operator. Uh, so here, this is basically the same as me saying, copy everything from this variable into this component. And so if things are working well and the demo gods are happy with me, that should now display again the exact same content because that's what I put in there. Um, so as a business user, I can now go into dynamic content, I can find the homepage hero slot, and I can start adding new content in here. So I've already gone ahead and created a new ethical beauty banner. So I'm going to add that in. I will drag that right to the top, hit save, and we should now see when we refresh new content at the top. And so I now as a business user have way more creative control over how this homepage looks and I don't have to get a developer involved and my developers can now go and spend some time thinking about all the components that they'd like to make available and all the features of the application. So, uh, okay, great. So hopefully that's a little bit clearer how to do, how simple it can be to just go and add some content management uh, into a progressive web app. The last thing I wanted to touch on is taking this and bringing it back into the CMS. Um, one of the things that is um, that you're doing when you're, when you're implementing a CMS, you're not just mapping data, right? You're actually designing a set of tools that your business users will use every single day to make content changes. And so we think it's really important that those tools work really well. And so dynamic content is full of features and extension points that you can use to make it a much nicer experience for business users to make changes. One of those is a feature called visualization. And this is a feature that lets you get a preview of the content that you're editing before it's even in a page. So before it even gets added to the home page or into a page, I would like to still see what that looks like, right? Why should I have to add it to a page and synchronize staging just to see what something's going to look like? And so visualization helps do that. So I've already created the code for this. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through it real quick. So what I've done is I've added a brand new page into my application called visualization. So this is a page that I'm going to embed in the CMS. Okay. And it looks, should look very similar to the home page, um, but some things are a little bit different. So when this page is requested, there's actually some extra data passed in on the query string. The key piece of information is which piece of content does, a, does the business user have open? Because what I want to do is I want to show them what the piece of content they're currently editing will look like. So it's no longer that I want to fetch the content that's on the home page. I want to fetch whatever content is open. So that gets passed into my application and I get access to those in Next.js using this context object. And so I'm fetching the content 
not by its key, but by its ID that was passed forward. From that point on, it's exactly the same. I now get a fragment of JSON from the CMS that I can display. And what I'm doing up here is I am setting, um, I'm doing something very similar to the previous example where depending on the component uh, constant that comes back, I will render it differently. And so now what I've got is I have a web page you can go to that can display any of the three components that a business user can put onto a page um, without actually putting those onto a page. And the great thing about this is I didn't have to create any new components. All I had to do was wrap this up in a very lightweight wrapper. It's using the exact same components that I already have built to give a nice visualization experience. So the final step to this is to go and plummet into the CMS. So I'm going to quickly just go to content types and when well, my browser is more responsive. <laughs> Refresh that. Stress of screen share on the computer. Uh, okay, so if I open up, let's let's look at the gallery block. Okay, so these are all the settings for how this data model, how this content type, should display to business users. And one of the features is this visualization feature. So all I have to do is provide a URL to my application. Now it has to be SSL. So in this case, I'm using an SSL proxy. So if I say visualizations, so that's the URL of the page I just created, and I want to pass in the ID. So we have these tokens that you can pass in, um, and uh, I also have in the field called content API, which is passed in. So if I call this my PWA, so now what's going to happen is my application can now be embedded in the user interface. So if I go and open up one of these gallery blocks, I should be able to click the visualization icon and see exactly what it's going to look like before it even goes on a page. So if I wanted to, I don't know, rearrange these components, for example, I can just hit save, reload immediately, and behind the scenes, it's just using the exact same components. I've just made them available and visible for my business users. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with that thought that it's not just about connecting the data, it's also about designing a really good set of tools and workflows for your business users to have a really good experience when they're managing content. And with that, I think we can just recap really quick and then get to some Q&A. Um, so hopefully that was really helpful. Um, we, uh, hopefully it's a little bit clearer now how you would go about sort of managing some experience management type components, how you would give business users a little bit more flexibility, and also how you would start to think about that business workflow when they're actually in there editing content every day. Um, and so just a couple of resources uh, at the top there. Um, that is the code for today's example. So if you want to go check that out, feel free. Um, and then below that is our product blog. Um, so that is using a statically generated architecture. So if you're interested in looking at an alternative pattern, that's a good place to go. And then uh, also our product blog itself uh, has tons of useful articles about different approaches. Uh, and our documentation's got some great tips in as well. So with that, I will pass over to Maddie for any questions. Thanks, Darren. That was brilliant. Um, so we do have a few questions. The first one um, is in the Q&A box. Um, where is the BFF aggregation layer? So it sort of depends. Um, sometimes people interpret BFF to mean it's an aggregation layer and it might also be the server running your, your React application. So there's typically two components. There's the actual server-side rendering, and there is also an API aggregation layer. Sometimes they can be the same component. Sometimes they're split out. It, it doesn't really make a ton of difference. It's more just of a uh, helping people work on it, on it in parallel, things like that, a little bit more cl uh, cleanliness. Um, but it would be its own component in your architecture. So it would be a set of APIs that you would be hosting. So you know they'd be in the cloud or something like that. Real. Thanks for that. Um, so <laughs> someone's added, I'm missing a clap hands feature in Zoom right now. Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> Which is a great point. Thank you. Um, the next question is regarding um, arrays. Um, how are they ordered when they are returned? I would like to control the order of my nav. 
do we assume it respects the order in which items are entered or can we override at a later point? Yeah, so, um, so the data that comes back from our CMS is standard JSON. So we basically provide standard JSON arrays, which are ordered. So basically the order that the business user puts them in the interface is the order they will come back and the business user can rearrange them. So inside our UI, you can rearrange those items. When they hit save and publish, the next time you call the API to get the content, it will be in the new order. So your application shouldn't have to think about reordering them or sorting them. They will be in whatever order the business user has curated them into, and that's not fixed. They can continue to reorder those. Brill. Thanks, Darren. And we have a few more, if that's okay. We do still have time. Um, does it make sense to put a CDN in front of a server-side rendered app? And how would you handle content updates and cache clearing? Cache clearing. Cool, yeah. Um, so it absolutely makes sense to put a CDN in front of a server-side rendered app. Um, you typically want to try and get that content that's coming back to be as cacheable as possible to get the best performance possible. Um, what I would recommend in terms of content updates and cache purging is to try and use a feature in CDNs that tends to be called something like um, surrogate keys in Fastly, and it has a different name in Akamai. Um, basically, what that does is it lets you sort of spear fish from the cache. So normally, you'd sort of say, I want to decache the entire home page or all of these different pages. Um, but actually, what you'd like to do instead is only decache the pages that have changed. That's the best way to get the best performance because if you take too many things out of the cache, that just means that it's going to be slightly slower for the next person to go and render that page. So when you're looking at tools like dynamic content, uh, a feature that you'll find in modern CMSs like ours is a feature called webhooks. So webhooks lets you do this sort of thing in real time. So basically you can create a webhook in our system and we will notify some code that you write, or in fact, you can even connect it directly to uh, Fastly and Akamai if you want, actually, with some recent updates we've done. Um, but basically, you can make it so that whenever the content changes inside Ampliance, it purges the CDN and it only purges the pages that were using that content. That's, that's the desirable architecture that you want to try and aim for. So that way, business users don't have to wait for like the, I don't know, the 3 p.m. purge, daily purge. They can just press publish and it's there immediately, right? That's, that's really what you want, fresh content, uh, while still maximizing the performance. That's great. Um, another question here, does it ever make sense to pull back HTML from dynamic content instead of JSON and inject that into the PWA? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, so it depends on your use case. Um, so the, typically, if you're building a progressive web app, the preferred pattern, I think, is to fetch back fetch the JSON and plumb that into your components like we did today. The, but the reason for doing that is if you do that, those components have access to all of the other functionality that's already in your React application or your, your PWA. So you know, if you already happen to have a product carousel component or a whole load of components that interact with your e-commerce like add to basket, you can use those in all of these other content managed components, which is super helpful. So you could have a content managed I don't know, product curated list of products and underneath each product, you would have the add to basket button, right? That would be a much nicer experience. The problem with injecting HTML into a React app is you can inject the HTML and it will style correctly if you have the styles available, but it doesn't have access to any of the other components in the React app. And so it tends to be very static HTML. And so it just won't be able to have all that same level of interaction. Now, there are cases where I think it does make sense that sometimes businesses have teams that are split up that way. So you might have a team whose responsibility is to build the PWA, and you might have another team whose responsibility is to make fresh content every day, like HTML, that's really specific because you maybe have a very, uh, very specific brand requirements and styling requirements. And so that might be a case where you want to have one team owning a set of HTML and another team just injecting that HTML. Um, but I think generally, if you can, I would prefer, uh, you should probably try and prefer JSON going into components rather than injecting HTML. But there are definitely use cases where injecting HTML does make sense. Awesome. Thanks, Darren. Um, another one just popped through on the Q&A. 
Um, firstly, really impressive demo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, not me, Darren. Um, is there any GraphQL-like layer available to request content or a means to request multiple content items in a single request via the content delivery API? That's a very timely question. Um, so uh, we are currently working on a, uh, a brand new multi-get API. We actually already have a multi-get API. So you can currently make a request to retrieve multiple objects and get back multiple objects. Um, we're actually releasing a new version of that that's just a little bit easier to work with. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, with GraphQL, so GraphQL is on our roadmap, but right now it's very easy to go and wrap up um, our current API, uh, put your GraphQL layer around our current API. Uh, we can certainly share some good insight on doing that with things like AppSync and Apollo. Uh, it's, it's super simple. You basically just need to create very simple resolvers that just do what we did in the demo today, basically. Um, so it's pretty easy to do. And the, ben the benefit of doing it inside your own GraphQL layer, which is if you do it inside a GraphQL layer inside your architecture, that will have access to not only the content, but also things like your Ecom APIs. And so you would be able to create APIs that return content and associated Ecom data. So for the example of a product carousel, you could have that one response return the content and the up-to-date pricing because your API will have access to all those different layers. Whereas on our side, we obviously just can provide the content. And so sometimes there are benefits for doing it upstream as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Darren. I think that's been absolutely uh, awesome. 50 minutes. In 50 minutes, folks, we've, we've uh, gone through a whole, you know, set up to, to get content management working in a PWA. I think that's, that's pretty amazing stuff. I know there's a massive amount of work going to that, Darren, to make that, you know, just as, as slick as it possibly can be. So thank you very much indeed for that. And thank you to everybody that, uh, that came along today to, to look at that and everybody that's gonna, gonna look at the recording as well. Uh, if you've got questions for, for any of us, obviously you can ping those through to ideally the CS team who can act as your intermediary in the first place. That's CS team, all one word, at amplints.com or uh, you can go look at some of those technical documents if you need to. And of course we can, in certain circumstances, give you access to product team and if necessary, Darren can pop on and help if you're really stuck with something important. Um, so uh, as Maddie's just changed the slide, very well done, Maddie. Um, I'll just pass back to you so that you can talk about what's upcoming and uh, then we can close. Thanks, James. Um, so thank you all again for joining today's sessions. Um, as with all the others, a recording of this session will be emailed across to you all tomorrow. Um, as you can see on this slide, and as James highlighted, we do have some more webinars coming up next week. Um, so on Monday, 6th of April, at 3 o'clock, we'll be running our session Leveraging Workflow Functionality to Better Support Remote Working. Um, so this will cover recent re recently released workflow functionality that enables closer and more efficient collaboration remotely. Um, and it will also cover how Ampliants can automatically work with communication tools. Um, and then following on from that session, um, on Wednesday, 8th of April at three o'clock, we will be hosting um, Content Hub and Dynamic Media training for new users. On Thursday, 9th of April at three o'clock, we will be hosting Dynamic Content training for new users. Um, so as Ben and James highlighted in an earlier session, and we are giving some free temporary licenses to our products to customers. Um, so if there's anyone you think will be suitable um, for those sessions, um, please forward the link on. Um, if you haven't already registered and would like to join, I've already popped the registration links in the chat box, um, but your um, CSMs will also email those details through to you um, over the next week. Um, for those that have registered, you will have received all the data details you need um, via email. Um, but if you have any more questions, again, just get in touch with the team. Um, and thank you again for joining. I really hope to see you all next week. Yeah, thanks, folks. Cheerio. Thank you, everybody.